Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it brings light and life. We thank you that you promise that it doesn't return void. Father, we pray that by your spirit, you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit says to the churches. Pray that you would give us a vision of yourself that would convict us and humble us, that would strengthen and sustain us, that would cause us to seek earnestly after you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At 4.31 a.m. on the morning of January 17th, 1994, a 6.7 magnitude earthquake struck Los Angeles' San Fernando Valley. The severe shaking woke up residents who discovered that power had gone out across the city. Many people stepped out of their homes to check on their houses or look after their neighbors, and then they looked up into the night sky. Some of those who looked up into the night sky called 911. They were alarmed by a giant silvery cloud that had suddenly appeared over the shaken city. Was this some kind of ghostly, cosmic effect of the earthquake? What was this massive shape in the sky they'd never seen before? Not to worry, the 911 respondents assured them. That was just the Milky Way. That galaxy that humans used to know so well. Until artificial lights over every city and every town have blinded it out of existence. Humanly created lights have obscured heaven's lights. You can't see what's really up there because of the light we're shining down here. This morning we're going to consider Revelation chapters 4 and 5, all of those glorious chapters in full. It's a majestic passage that gives us a key to the whole book and a key to the whole Bible. The passage starts on page 1030. If your pew Bibles are the same as our church's pew Bibles, I'm just taking a guess. Near the very end of the Bible, Revelation chapters 4 and 5. The whole book of Revelation is like an earthquake that knocks the power out so that you can see what's really going on up in heaven and in this world. And this vision of heaven that Revelation gives us makes far more of a difference to your life than the Milky Way ever could. What Revelation reveals is ultimate reality. Revelation reveals the ultimate destination of all things and the ultimate purpose of all things. So often our sight of reality is clouded by human inventions human creations, humanly devised values, things we've come up with for ourselves that we devote ourselves to, or even worship. So many human values and aspirations are like the light pollution from electric street lights at night. They keep you from seeing something that has a far greater grandeur. And whether you see that reality that our humanly devised lights block us from seeing, has eternal significance. This raises questions like, is God real? Is He in charge? Is He worth worshiping and obeying? How will this whole universe's story end? How can all that's wrong with the world be made right? How can all that's wrong with you be made right? Those are some of the questions that our passage for this morning addresses. Just to recap from the book of Revelation, since we're jumping into the middle, so far in this book, John has received a vision of the risen Lord Jesus Christ reigning in glory. He has recorded Jesus' own messages to give to seven churches in the region of Asia Minor, modern Turkey. Now, in chapters 4 and 5, the revealing that's promised in the book begins in earnest. Our passage reports a vision. These two chapters tell us what John saw when, being guided by the Holy Spirit, he was taken up into heaven and given a glimpse of who's there, 
Who's at the center? What are they saying? What are they doing? John's glimpse of heaven shows you what you need to see in order to see this world as it really is and in order to see your life as it is and as it should be. John shows us reality as it is in heaven and as it will one day be on earth. The question that our passage drives us toward is what do you most need to see? And its answer is that you need to see God as He really is, as the one who is. More specifically, our passage's answer to that question, what do you need to see, can be split up into four parts. You need to see the one who is, point one, delightfully different. The one who is delightfully different. We see this in Revelation 4, verse 1 through the first part of verse 6. Please look with me at verses 1 to 6. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. The voice speaking in verse 1 is Jesus himself. He addresses John in the voice of a loud trumpet like he does back in chapter 1, verse 10. Now this vision is the first in a series of visions that will take place throughout the rest of the book. So when Jesus says he's going to show John what must take place after this, he's not putting the vision of chapters 4 and 5 exclusively into the future. Instead, he's inaugurating this series of visions and giving a general description of all the visions that follow. These visions in general are going to talk about the things that are to come. Walk, just walking through these verses, in verse 2, John sees God's throne, which symbolizes God's absolute authority over all things. It's interesting in the passage, God isn't named, and there isn't any description given of His appearance. Instead, John focuses all of our attention on the throne. The opening of the vision answers the question, who's in charge? The answer is ultimately God alone. God alone is sovereign and supreme over this universe. In the modern West, the thing that people most like to do with thrones is knock others off of them. We have a deep-seated, culture-wide suspicion of absolute authority. And that suspicion can be a healthy one, as long as the one wielding the absolute authority is a sinful, fallen human being like ourselves. But God shares none of our imperfections. God shares none of our limitations. God's absolute authority is absolutely good. God's absolute reign is absolutely right. That's the point of John's laser focus on God's throne. And then in verses 3 to 6, John compares the appearance of God's glory to that of precious stones. Precious stones focus and concentrate light. That's why they reflect such brilliant colors. They make some of the glory of light visible and tangible. And that's what this vision is doing with God's intrinsic beauty and glory. It's reflecting some of it, refracting it, making it available to John's and our senses. Then the rainbow around the throne is a further manifestation of that glory, and it's a reminder of God's promise, hearkening back to the book of Genesis. God's promise to Noah that he would never again flood the earth, that he would faithfully preserve creation. Moving on into verse 4, we see 24 thrones around the one throne, and seated on these thrones are 24 
elders. These elders are most likely angels who represent God's whole redeemed people. They sit on thrones, they're clothed in white, they wear crowns. Those are all specific promises that God makes to His people of what we will obtain when we faithfully endured to the end. So the 24 elders are now what we will all be then. They're a picture of our future. Then we see lightning and rumbling and thunder that come from the throne. These echo the way God manifested Himself to His people at Mount Sinai when He gave the law. They're the same kind of threatening signs of His power, His holiness, saying only those who are holy may dare approach. Only those who are pure and perfect as God is may come in. That's reminding us that God alone is the lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. Then we read in verse 5 that there are before the throne seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. This is similar to a reference to God's seven spirits or sevenfold spirit in chapter 1. I don't think we should take that number literally as if there's seven spirits, but instead the number seven is symbolic referring to the Holy Spirit as the fullness of God, the completeness of God's revealing power. The Holy Spirit is the light of God Himself. He's ready to illumine any mind. He's ready to reveal any heart. And then the last feature of the throne is seen is in verse 6. Before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. What is this sea, and why is it before God's throne? To the ancient Hebrews, the sea represented opposition, destruction, and chaos. The Red Sea was the threatening barrier they had to pass through, that God delivered them through on their way out of Egypt. Uh, Isaiah 51 verse 9 portrays God's work in the Exodus of parting the Red Sea as the destruction of an ancient dragon or serpent, as if by splitting the sea, He cut the serpent in two. Later in Revelation, in chapter 13, the beast is going to rise out of the sea to oppose God and oppress His people. So the sea is a source of danger, of opposition, of threats. The sea symbolizes the forces that reject God and persecute His people. But here, in the heavenly throne room, the sea is perfectly still. It's so still it looks like crystal or glass. Like if you went out to a lake first thing in the morning, there's not a breath of wind. You can see the trees around the lake reflected absolutely clearly. It is perfectly still. Perfect calm, perfect peace. This glassy, crystalline sea before God's throne represents God's complete mastery over all the forces of evil. Where God is, there's no threat of harm. There's no threat of opposition, no threat of persecution. Whatever you're most afraid of, bring it into God's presence and it melts into perfect stillness. In God's presence, everything is completely subdued, completely under control, not even a puff of air rippling the surface of the water. If you want perfect security, come and bow before God's throne. The overall point of these six verses is to give us a glimpse of a God who is delightfully different from us. He's so different from us that we can't possibly comprehend how different he is from us. One politician is more powerful than another. This one has been serving in office longer. That one serves on this committee. This one has more seniority. That one's in a district where he's impervious to being primaried. But God has all power, incomparable power, absolute power. Down the street from where I live in the church where I serve is the House of Representatives, where there are 448 permanent seats on the floor. But strictly speaking, in heaven, there's only one throne that counts. God doesn't just differ from creatures. He differs from all creation, differently from how any creatures differ from each other. He's he's transcendent. He's exalted. He's sublime. He's holy. And God isn't just different from us, but He's delightfully different. God Himself is the source of all beauty, all delight, everything that is good and desirable and glorious. These images of rainbows and precious stones are meant to give just the faintest impression of how infinitely delightful God is in Himself. 
Now, a lot of people who are not Christians and who maybe don't subscribe to any institutional religion still believe in God. They're not atheists. They're not agnostics. They would say they believe in God. Maybe that describes you. If so, I would ask you, how do you know what God is like? Where does your understanding of God come from? How would you sort out a true thought of God from a false thought of God? What can show you or teach you the difference? It's always tempting for us to project our fallenness onto God, to think that He shares our own moral failures. It's always tempting for us to project our finitude onto God, to think He's limited in the ways that we are, to imagine that God is a lot like us, only bigger. But God is gloriously unlike us in both His being and His character. Our fundamental response to this vision should be desire and delight. We should delight in God because He is infinitely delightful in Himself. And we should desire union with Him, communion with Him, and fellowship with Him. Once in a while, a new song will come out that just grabs hold of me. I, I listen to it, I'm hooked in the first 30 seconds, and I just put it on repeat. I can't stop listening to it. Maybe I'll text it out to a few of my friends who share my taste in music. Matt Merker, Zach DePrima, maybe even Alex DePrima. I put the song on repeat and just let it play. What is it about that song that so hooks my, my mind and my heart? Well, in the best music, every single aspect of it is, is sort of good and right in itself. Whether the, the melody, the rhythm, the harmony, the beat, the timbre of the vocalist, the little inflection and riff on the melody... Whatever you, whatever you pay attention to amply rewards that attention. And every single piece fits together into a compelling whole, the way all of that comes together. It's all compelling in itself, and it all makes you want to listen more. The song's beauty burrows into your heart, and it hooks you. Brothers and sisters, when you get a glimpse of the one true God, like the vision John was given here, His delightful difference will burrow into your heart and mind. And He will draw out desire for Himself. He will keep you coming back to Him. To know Him. To love Him. To serve Him. To devote your life to Him. What do you most need to see? You need to see one who is delightfully different. And because He's delightfully different, He is also, point two, worthy of worship. Worthy of worship. In verses 6 to 11 of chapter 4. We see how all the creatures in heaven continually worship the one who sits on the throne. Look first with me at verses 6 to 8 of chapter 4. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. These verses teach us that the heavenly elders worship God and so should we. They teach us that the heavenly elders worship God because of His divine holiness and preserving power. God alone simply is. God alone is the cause of all that exists. And so God alone is worthy of worship. In verses 6 and 7, the living creatures represent the whole created order. The mightiest wild animal, the strongest domesticated animal, man, the only rational animal, and the eagle, the most majestic flying animal. They're said to be around the throne, and I think uh, in keeping with a similar vision in Ezekiel 1, we're meant to understand that they actually form part of the throne. They're around the throne in such a way that they're built into it. The point of that is it symbolizes how God rightly rules over these creatures who represent all creation, and they willingly submit to and delight in His supremacy. They not only submit to His supremacy, they declare it. Verse 8, the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, 
Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. These living creatures are like the seraphim that Isaiah saw in his vision of the, holy, of the heavenly temple in Isaiah chapter 6. Not only do they each have six wings, but they cry out the same praise of God. Holy, holy, holy. This brief confession of praise is constructed in three threes, three triads. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The first triad declares that God is holy, meaning He's utterly different from creatures. He's radically pure. He's completely devoted to His own goodness and glory. As one scholar put it, holiness is glory concealed. Glory is holiness revealed. Then the second triad provides an interpretation of God's revealed name. He's the one true God. He's revealed himself to his people as Yahweh. That's what the title Lord is standing for. And Almighty. He's supreme over all powers. It's a, it's a brief unpacking of God's names and their significance for us. He's the only God. He's the Lord of his people. He's supreme over all. And then the third triad declares that God is eternal and unchangeable. Was and is and is to come. All of us creatures, our lives have a start date and an end date. But God never came into being. He has simply always existed. He has life in himself. In verse 8, John bends the rules of Greek grammar to be able to say that God always was because he always is. God infinitely possesses fullness of life. That's another reason why he's worthy of worship. In response to God's holiness, his uniqueness, his almightiness, we should be convicted of our sins and confess them as, as we've already done together. We should recognize ways we fall short, humble ourselves before God, declare those things to Him, ask for His power in turning away from them. We should also grow the more devoted to God and dedicated to Him. The Lord says to His people, you shall be holy for I am holy. We should delight in God's holiness and imitate God's holiness. Now, John's vision is beginning to move outward in concentric circles. That's one of the key movements of our whole passage. The throne itself is at the center. The four living creatures around the throne are praising God. And then this declaration of praise that shows their right response to God starts echoing outward from the center. John moves one circle further out. Look at verses 9 to 11. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are You, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things, and by Your will they existed and were created. In response to the living creatures' worship, now the elders worship. Their casting down their crowns shows their submission. They're glad humbling themselves before the Lord. Their crowns signify their authority, but the fact that they're throwing them down means it's as if the only reason they have that authority in the first place is to willingly lay it down before the Lord. Here the elders worship God and they give us the reason why. Worthy are you, for you created all things. God is the absolute, unaided source of all that is. God didn't rearrange existing raw materials. Instead, God's work of creation is more like if Mozart invented sound in order to be able to compose music. God doesn't just paint a picture. He creates color and paper and brushes and eyes to see it. God's creation is absolute and total. The doctrine of creation is crucial for rightly understanding who God is and rightly responding to Him. So many intellectual struggles that people have when they're exploring Christianity are resolved by rightly understanding God's work of creation. One example would be, what about all the miracles in the Old Testament? There's, there's food that's multiplied, people are brought back to life, an axe head floats. What's going on? Did those really happen? Well, God created all things. 
God keeps all things in existence at every moment. Everything exists by His will and power. So it's no trouble for Him to change some tiny little piece of creation so that it works a little bit differently for a little while. That's well within His scope to do. Or how can the Bible be both God's words and human words? Isn't that a contradiction? Not at all. We can only ever speak because God enables us to speak. He gives us life. He gives us minds. He gives us breath. He gives us understanding. God is always enabling all of our speech. Now, of course, it's a, it's a unique and special work for God to enable human authors to write in such a way that the words they write are His very words. It is a special work, but it's a special version of a work He's always already doing. Brothers and sisters, the doctrine of creation not only aids our understanding, it fuels our worship. What makes worship delightful is God Himself. He's infinitely delightful and infinitely worthy of worship. We worship God because of who He is in Himself, what He alone can do, and what He alone has done and will do. God Himself deserves our unlimited, absolute devotion. Do you ever get bored during corporate worship? Now, there may be times, I wouldn't say so much here at Emmanuel, but perhaps in a church you might visit. <laughs> There may be times where various leaders of the church may be to blame for reasons why you could get bored during worship. But it also could be that you're getting bored with God. It could be that your heart is more drawn to whatever earthly good you're seeking next than it is drawn to worship the Lord for His infinite, intrinsic beauty. And it's a spiritually dangerous place to be bored with God. Most of the state of Arizona is mountain-studded desert. It's empty. It's vast. It has only two major urban sprawls, Phoenix and Tucson, which means there's a whole lot of wide-open, empty night sky. As a result, Arizona hosts more than 30 observatories where, where huge telescopes use all that dark night sky to study the heavens. Some of the scientists from those observatories have banded together to form the International Dark Sky Association. They work to raise awareness about light pollution. They advocate for the use of artificial lights that minimize the kind of glare that bounces back up. It aims down so that the light points where it's supposed to and the night sky can stay dark. These astronomers want to see what's really up there. And they want other people to be able to see it too. Brothers and sisters, every faithful local church is a dark sky association. When we gather each Sunday for corporate worship, we're helping each other to blink out the lights of false promises and empty hopes. When we sing, when we pray, when we hear God's word preached, when we encourage each other after the service, we're helping each other to shut off worldly artificial lights and gaze up into heaven at what really is the case and who's really up there. We help each other set our eyes on the one who's delightfully different and who alone is worthy of worship. We want to see who's really up there. And we want other people to see him too. That's why we exist. That's why we form local churches. That's what we're doing right here, right now. Now, one way to summarize what John saw in all of chapter 4 is that he saw a heavenly worship service. This is what's going on all the time in heaven. It's a picture of creatures rightly responding to who God is. So chapter 4, heavenly worship service. But what he's going to see that takes up chapter 5 is not, not so much a heavenly worship service, but a heavenly drama. So what comes next? Point three, we see one who is supreme over the whole story. What do you need to see? You need to see one who is supreme over the whole story. We see this drama begin to play out in chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Supreme over the whole story, chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Look first at verses 1 and 2. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, 
Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? This scroll in God's right hand represents His purposes for all of human history, which culminates in salvation and judgment on the last day. You can picture a scroll rolled up sideways with seals on different rings in the roll. If you open one of those seals, a portion of the scroll opens and its contents are revealed. So the question in verse 2, who is worthy to open the scroll, amounts to this. Who can execute God's purposes for history? Who has the authority to take God's plans from God's hand and carry out God's will for all of God's creation? Can you do that? Can any human being do that? Can any angel do that? Who is worthy of such a task? Verses 3 and 4. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. John's weeping here might take us by surprise. It might be startling. I think we should pause and take it seriously. This is weighty. This is grave. He's utterly undone. He's broken by the lack of someone who can take the scroll. It's not like if you took home an Ikea table and its instructions were somehow missing. Oh, well, I guess I can't make the table. That, that plan won't come to pass. Your life's not going to be all that different. Why is John weeping? John's weeping because it looks like all of creation will be stalled in futility. It looks like creation will get stuck in pain, in injustice. John weeps to voice the lament of all creation, which is mired in sin and suffering. If no one is found who's worthy to take the scroll, does that mean the world's going to be stuck like this forever? John weeps to voice creation's weeping before God's throne. John's tears represent all the tears that God will one day wipe away. And John's about to learn how. But before we move on to the solution, it's worth lingering a moment over the problem. A legitimate response to creation's brokenness is lament. There are many hardships in this world where the most fitting response is to weep. Lament tells the truth about the world's brokenness and futility. Lament tells the truth about what's wrong with the world. And we're about to see how it's going to be made right. Look at verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Here Jesus is introduced with two titles from the Old Testament that look forward to the coming of the Messiah. That title, the Lion of Judah, is from Genesis 49. The root of David is from Isaiah 11. Both titles treat Jesus as a king. Lion teaches us to look for someone powerful, authoritative, kingly, in command. Not only that, but he's conquered. He's a king who's won a battle to found a kingdom. And because of this, he's worthy to take the scroll and execute God's plans for all of history. That's what John hears. Now consider what he sees. Verses 6 and 7. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. John hears of a lion. He sees a lamb. Now, the lion and the lamb are, of course, one and the same person, our Lord Jesus Christ. But the contrast from what he hears to what he sees, is crucial. What he hears sets up categories of Old Testament promise and expectation. What he sees shows us how Jesus fulfills those promises and expectations. Jesus did conquer. He did win a victory. He did triumph over all the forces of evil. But he did it 
by dying. He did it by being slain as a lamb. He won this victory on the cross. He triumphed by being defeated. He conquered by being killed. And that unexpected, upside-down shape of Jesus' victory is also the shape of the entire Christian life. That's one of the key themes of the whole book of Revelation. Christians don't conquer opposition with power, but by truth. Even martyrdom isn't defeat, but victory. Because faithful witness, even unto death, is a victory for the truth. Now, when verse 6 tells us that John saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, I think the basic point is that Jesus, even in His exalted glorified state, still bears the marks of His crucifixion. His seven horns are a symbol of divine power. His seven eyes are a symbol of divine knowledge. And they're identified as God's sevenfold spirit. The spirit belongs not only to God, but to Christ. And then in verse 7, John sees the Lamb take the scroll. I think this is a figurative reference to Christ's exaltation to heaven when He took His seat at God's right hand on heaven's throne. After conquering our sin by His death, Christ claimed His rightful place as ruler over all creation. Here's the point for you and me. The scroll of history rests secure in the hand that was pierced for your transgressions. The hand that holds the course of all of the unfolding events of history is the hand that was pierced for you. So in one sense, Revelation 4 tells us what's always the case in heaven. This is where things are always going right because creatures are always rightly responding to who God is. But Revelation 5 tells us what became the case in heaven when the resurrected Christ arrived there. Which means that back in verse 5, one little phrase gives us a key to the whole passage. So that, verse 5, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Because Jesus triumphed over death by death, he's worthy to open the scroll. And the message that's rolled up in that scroll is this, Jesus wins. Jesus has won, Jesus will win, Jesus has conquered our sins, and all who trust in Him will conquer in Him. In order to see this world as it really is, you need to see the one who's supreme over the whole story. To know where this universe is headed, look to the slain Lamb who triumphed at the cross. The only way you can know what's going on in this bruised and broken world is by knowing the end of the story. My wife Kristen and I like to watch detective mystery shows together, and whenever we start a new one, she goes on the internet and looks up the plot so she can see the end of the whole season. To me, this makes no sense. Uh, please no spoilers. <laughs> I don't understand why, why you want to know everything before we're watching it. I don't even want to see like a flicker of expression on her face when some new character is introduced because maybe, you know, they're the one who's going to get killed off, right? But whenever I've questioned my wife's strange plot-ruining habit, <laughs> she has a ready comeback. She says Christians know the end of the story. How do you argue with that? Your life, if it hasn't already, will run into plot twists, disappointment, devastation. It is much harder to bear than any TV plot. The only way you can faithfully endure those brutal twists and turns by knowing the end of the story. The end of the story is right here. It's seen in Jesus' victory over the cross and His triumph over the grave. But how can the end of this story become good news for you? How can you get in on this? Point four, Savior of Sinners. To know reality as it truly is, you need to fix your eyes on the one, the only one, who is the Savior of sinners. 
We see Jesus' saving work celebrated in chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. Look first at verses 8 to 10. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You might not have noticed this, but in the two poetic sections of chapter 4, those are what the elders and the living creatures said. We might think they're songs because they're set off as poetry, but they're spoken. No one has sung until now. And they sing a new song because they're celebrating the Lamb's new work of salvation. They're celebrating how the Lamb has ransomed, restored, and reinstated people from every nation. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. God is our creator and we owe our very lives to Him. But none of us have dedicated our lives to God as we ought. None of us have lived holy lives. None of us have worshipped Him as He deserves. None of us have obeyed Him and submitted to Him as He both deserves and demands. So all that our lives have earned for ourselves from God is justice, is condemnation, is eternal punishment. As the book of Revelation so clearly teaches over and over again, the only thing we deserve from God is to be judged by God forever. But that little phrase for you were slain, is the solution to all that. It's the answer to all that. Jesus was slain in the place of all those who had turned from sin and trust in Him. Jesus being slain bore the wrath of God against all the sins of those who would turn and believe. And by being slain, He purchased. He effectually redeemed. As we heard uh, earlier, some of us at least, in Scott's class on uh, Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us by becoming a curse for us. He purchased us. He bought us. That's an effectual accomplishment. There's nothing unsure about it. There's nothing partial about it. He didn't use an installment plan. This is not a credit card debt to be paid off later. He paid the full price to secure the salvation of people, as we read, from every tribe and language and people and nation. He bore our sins in His death. He triumphed over the grave by resurrection. And now He invites people from every nation to repent of their sins and trust in Him. If you've not put your faith in Christ to save you, repent and believe in Him today. If you've persisted in thinking that somehow you could become a good enough person to get right with God, drop that folly and run to Jesus. He has paid the price in full for all those who believe. And He's restored us. He's reinstated us, all who believe, made us a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So at present, we serve God in the Spirit and worship Him as priests. We triumph over sin and death and the devil and are even now exercising kingly power and authority, and one day we'll reign with Him in a new heaven and earth. Jesus has restored all that we've done wrong. He has restored all that's wrong with us. And one day He will restore all that's wrong with this entire world. How you get in on that is by turning from sin and trusting in Jesus. Looking at verses 11 to 14. The concentric circles and shockwaves continue to ripple outward. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. In these verses, these heavenly and earthly creatures worship Jesus. They worship Him in the same terms that they used to worship God back in chapter 4. 
Not only that, but the final confession in verse 13 brings together the one who sits on the throne, God the Father, and the Lamb, God the Son, as one fitting object of praise. If you ever have a Jehovah's Witness come to your door, tell you Jesus isn't divine, you can take them right to this passage. All creatures in heaven and on earth worship Jesus. And here again, we see the circles of praise expand outward. It starts with elders around the throne, then it continues with an enormous number of angels, and then every creature joins in the praise. It's as if Jesus' saving work of purchasing a people for God is a pebble dropped into the surface of the universe, and its shockwaves of expanding praise won't stop expanding until the whole universe is filled with declarations of the glory of Jesus. In one sense, this this vision collapses the present and the future into one scene. It takes us from the present all the way up to the end in one motion. At present, heavenly beings do recognize Christ's supremacy, but we don't yet hear this acknowledgement from every creature everywhere in creation. I think John's vision is like a symbolic version of what Paul says in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, that one day, at the end of history, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. This doesn't mean that every person will be saved, but it does mean that every person will acknowledge Christ's supremacy. The Savior of sinners will one day be supreme over everyone, everywhere. On that day, no artificial light will block the sight of Christ's glory. This passage presents to all of us a challenge that's also an invitation. We see again and again in John's vision, the throne with the one true God seated on it is at the center. The question for you is, is this God who's at the center of heaven at the center of your heart? Is your life devoted to Him and dedicated to Him? Do you crown Him with many crowns? We should, because He's the Lamb upon the throne. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise You because You are worthy of all worship. You alone are the God who is. You alone are the God who created all things. And we praise you for accomplishing salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that this glorious vision would capture our hearts and that we would worship you, devote ourselves to you, serve you, and glorify you. We pray that we would put our confidence completely in the Lamb who is slain for us. That we would crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.